Hey everybody, and welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today, we will be watching Napoleon 1813, Battle of the Nations by Epic History TV. So, this is another video in Epic History TV's Napoleonic War series. We're coming pretty close to the end. We've only got a couple more episodes left. Uh, I will be watching uh, the series on Napoleon's Marshals after this, so don't you worry. Tune in for that. Uh, in the last episode, we saw... Wellington's victories in Spain. Uh, you know, the French were being pushed back all the way to the French border. So, you know, it's not going well for the French there. And we've been sort of leading up to a big battle uh, with Napoleon and, you know, his European enemies. And that's what this video is going to be on. Um, I apologize if I have to clear my throat or cough during this video. Uh, I have COVID right now. <laughs> and I'm dealing with some mild symptoms. Not too bad, but, <clears throat> you know, just... Uh, you know, just uh, a cough and, and that kind of stuff. So, uh, apologies for that. But aside from that, you know, we'll have some uh, normal commentary this video. Uh, anyway, I'm excited to get into this one. So, let's jump right into it. Yeah. I mean, we are really getting down to it uh, at this point. You know, Napoleon has had a lot of successes throughout his career. He's also made a lot of mistakes at this point, and now it's coming down to the wire. He has to win, or it could all be over. October 1813. Napoleon Bonaparte faced his greatest crisis since becoming Emperor of the French nine years before. Hmm. His long war in Spain had ended in defeat, and an Anglo-Spanish-Portuguese army had now crossed the Pyrenees to invade France itself. Yeah, and I mean, we talked about this last time, but everything's really closing in on Napoleon. As we can see, you know, Wellington is right on the border uh, of France, and this was really the first time that, you know, actual French territory had been threatened in, I mean, years and years. I mean, France had, you know, found success against her foes since, you know, the early to mid-1790s before Napoleon was really that important. So this is the first time France has been seriously challenged in a really long time. In Germany, the Kingdom of Bavaria had switched sides and joined the Sixth Coalition against France. <coughs> While in Saxony, Napoleon faced four armies converging on him from all directions. What's more, these were not the same bunglers he'd crushed in 1805 and 6 at Austerlitz and Jena. Yeah, a lot has changed. And, you know, we got to this point directly because the Allies had developed a strategy of basically uh, avoiding Napoleon. You know, whenever Napoleon was elsewhere, they would swoop in and fight French forces, usually getting a victory, and Napoleon would have to race back to fight them, and they would flee. So, you know, they'd learned throughout their time fighting Napoleon that the best way to beat the French forces was to fight them when Napoleon wasn't there. Not to mention that, you know, uh, many of the armies throughout Europe had modernized greatly since the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars, you know, learning directly from Napoleon and his organization. Um, so at this point, Napoleon is facing, you know, m much more advanced foes than he was years ago, though he is getting that major battle that he wanted. You know, while the Allies are avoiding Napoleon at every point, all he wants is a big battle where, you know, he can truly show his tactical brilliance. Well, he's finally getting that big battle he wanted. But let's see if it goes his way. Russia, Austria, and Russia had all learned from their mistakes. They were now better organized, trained, and led, mm. and more wary of Napoleon. The largest coalition force was the Army of Bohemia, commanded by Austrian Field Marshal, the Prince of Schwarzenberg. His was a huge mixed Austrian-Russian-Prussian army of 194,000 men and 790 guns. To the north, Blücher's Army of Silesia and the Army of the North under Napoleon's ex-Marshal Bernadotte, 
now Crown Prince of Sweden. Together, 130,000 men and 536 guns. To the southeast, General Benningsen's Army of Poland, besieging Dresden. Another 34,000 men and 135 guns. So, I mean, we're talking about an absolutely massive number of men. Uh, I mean, we saw that with the invasion of Russia as well, just hundreds of thousands uh, of men involved. I mean, these have got to be some of the biggest armies Europe has seen uh, up to this point. So, you know, just an absolutely massive uh, amount of manpower. In total, the coalition had fielded 360,000 men and 1,500 guns, with Russia supplying the bulk of the troops. One unique addition to Bernadotte's Army of the North was a single troop of British rocket artillery, an experimental weapon system based on the Congreve rocket, a type mm. seen here in 1830. Although wildly inaccurate, their high-explosive warhead could be devastating at close range. Napoleon's forces around Leipzig were outnumbered almost two to one. But with 200,000 men and 700 guns, the Grande Armée was still a force to be reckoned with. It was. Um, it was definitely still a force to be reckoned with, though it has changed a lot. Um, now, Napoleon is outnumbered, um, but we've seen him outnumbered in the past, and we've seen him win while being outnumbered. But, you know, a lot has changed. You know, the Grand Armée gained fame because it was such a well-organized, disciplined force that was so committed to the cause. Um, but, you know, through the years and years of fighting, particularly the invasion of Russia, you know, many of the men who once made up the Grand Armée have died. You know, this is, you know in many ways, a whole new group of men. I mean, after the failed campaign in Russia, Napoleon basically had to raise a whole new army. And so he's lost a lot of the advantage that he once had from, you know, his extremely well-trained force. Not to mention, I remember early on, uh, you know, early on in the Napoleonic Wars, we talked about how one of the advantages Napoleon had was that his force was mainly French, Whereas a lot of the forces you were fighting against was a mixed bundle of different nationalities and ethnicities, you know, because he was fighting against several armies, Russians, Prussians, Austrians, not to mention that, for example, the Austrian army, well, the Austrian army is a mix of Austrians, Hungarians, Czechs, etc., etc., you know, a ton of different ethnic groups, and that can make it more difficult to organize, you know, just the language barrier alone, but now... Uh, Napoleon's army is a lot more multinational, multi-ethnic than it once was. You know, it's far less less French in character. Um, and we saw that, um, you know, sort of uh, impact the campaign in Russia. You know, there was definitely difficulty um, with organization. Um, so, you know, the Grand Armée definitely still a force to be reckoned with, particularly with Napoleon at its head but it has changed a lot from where it once was. Many experienced troops and commanders, even though it increasingly relied on young conscripts to make mm. up numbers. There were another 140,000 men that Napoleon could not call on. General Rapp's 10th Corps besieged in Danzig, Marshal Saint-Cyr's 1st Corps besieged in Dresden, Marshal Davout's 13th Corps, holding Hamburg, as well as several smaller besieged garrisons across Germany and Poland. Napoleon was currently about 20 miles north of Leipzig, with the bulk of his army. Marshal Murat was 40 miles to the south, with 90,000 men, covering Schwarzenberg. Napoleon now decided to rapidly join Murat, with their temporary superiority in numbers, defeat Schwarzenberg before Bernadotte and Blücher could intervene. Murat had orders to conduct a fighting withdrawal northwards. But at Liebert Volkwitz, he was drawn into major combat with the enemy's advance guard. 
Around 12,000 horsemen fought what some have described as the largest cavalry battle in Europe's history. Wow. Nura, in the thick of it as usual, was very nearly captured by Prussian dragoons. The battle ended in a minor coalition victory, with around 2,000 casualties on each side. The next day, Napoleon arrived to take command. This video is sponsored by The Great Courses Plus, <clears throat> home of... All right, shout out to Epic More History than 11, TV. Uh, and their sponsor, you know, go and check out their video, which is linked down below. Go and check out their sponsor, as you can see, is listed on the screen here. You know, go show them uh, some love. This plus for sponsoring this video. Mm. Yep, clearly those involved understand the magnitude of this battle, including Napoleon himself. Day one. By the 16th of October, Napoleon had concentrated most of his forces south of Leipzig. Field Marshal Schwarzenberg, meanwhile, against Russian advice, had deployed his army on either side of the Pleiser River, which would hinder his movements throughout the battle. Hmm. See, and, you know, when... We, we are talking about how the Grand Armée is different than it once was, but it is still under the leadership of Napoleon and Napoleon alone. The coalition, despite what has changed, still doesn't have that luxury. It still consists of several different national armies uh, under different men. So, despite all that's changed, you know, they still have that disadvantage of not being united in the way that the French forces are. Napoleon had entrusted the northern sector to Marshal Ney, with orders to keep an eye out for Blücher and Bernadotte. But Napoleon didn't expect them for at least another day, and so Ney had orders to transfer most of his troops south for the attack on Schwarzenberg. Mm. Schwarzenberg, however, knew that Blücher and Bernadotte were closer than Napoleon suspected and that Bennigsen was also marching up from Dresden. This was the moment the coalition had been waiting for. All their armies converging on Napoleon, with overwhelming superiority in numbers. I mean, yeah, this was the strategy, was that they wanted to harass the French forces, avoiding Napoleon until they could secure um, circumstances which they felt were favorable to their victory over Napoleon, and this was supposedly it. I mean, the vast numerical superiority um, they believe should be enough alone to give them the victory over Napoleon, plus the fact that, you know, they're acting pretty decisively, quickly, you know, more so than Napoleon would expect. This is sort of another change that we've seen, you know, back back in the good old days, the early days of the wars, you know, Napoleon would always have the upper hand. You know, he was always acting faster. He would have the information he needed. His opponents would lag behind, or they would fail to take advantage of, you know, any situate benefits they had. But uh, nowadays, oftentimes Napoleon struggles to get good intel, um, and his opponents can act, you know, uh, more fast than he would expect. You know, they can act decisively in a way that they wouldn't have in the past. However, the coalition's <coughs> headquarters were nothing like Napoleon's, where one man's will decided all. Schwarzenberg had to attempt to coordinate the actions of three large armies from three separate states. And although he was commander-in-chief, his plans still needed to be approved by Emperor Alexander, the supreme commander. Mm. whilst he also managed relations with the King of Prussia and the Emperor of Austria, all of whom were present at his headquarters. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> we talked about how the coalition forces are not unified like the French forces. There's also politics at play. You know, these are several sovereign nations trying to operate together. 
Um, and I mean, we know how difficult it is for different countries to collaborate, <clears throat> especially on something um, of this scale. Um, so you kind of have, obviously, they have, you know, common interests, but I'm sure they also have competing interests in some ways. And so those things sort of have to, you know, intertwine. Um, not to mention that, you know, if you know anything about these figures, uh, Alexander in particular was a very interesting character, a very forceful character. You know, if Alexander wanted something, he would get it. Or he would at least try to get it until it was no longer feasible. So, you know, he's someone who really wants to have his way and will really be involved with, um, you know, the military process and the diplomacy following the war. So, you know, he's quite an involved character uh, in this situation. The plan finally agreed was for General Wittgenstein's core group to lead an attack in four main columns, with two Austrian flanking attacks west of the Pleiser. At 8 a.m., a bombardment began along the line as Russian, Austrian and Prussian infantry regiments advanced across cold, muddy fields. Mm. Wachau soon fell to Russian infantry, but French artillery fire made it impossible for them to advance further. Victor's second corps then counterattacked, retaking the village at Bayonet Point. Wachau would change hands twice more that morning. Jeez. These bloody contests for small Saxon villages would come to typify the fighting around Leipzig. Yeah, we have seen some of this throughout the war, just brutal urban fighting uh, as towns are taken, retaken, you know, they go back and forth. Um, yeah, you, <laughs> you know, gotta hope you're not unlucky enough to be a resident of one of these towns um, throughout, you know, sort of central eastern Europe where these armies were going back and forth so often because your town is, uh, by the end of it, probably been trampled to the ground. I mean, you've had two opposing armies uh, passing through and conquering your town several times over. Um, you know, just very destructive and, and brutal fighting. At Markleberg, Kleist's Prussian Second Corps drove out the Polish defenders after bitter fighting. While on the left bank of the Pleiser, Merveldt's Austrian Second Corps struggled across broken ground to attack well-defended villages. Mm. Their assault on Konowitz stalled, but with heavy losses, the Austrians got a toehold in Derlitz. On the right flank, around 10 a.m., Klenau's 4th Corps occupied the high ground of the Kolmberg and fought its way into Liebert Volkwitz. Napoleon, observing from Gallows Hill, ordered up Augereau's 9th Corps and the Young Guard in support. Macdonald's 11th Corps was now also arriving in position on his left. His troops retook the Kolmberg and counterattacked Liebert Vogwitz, driving out the Austrians and pursuing them over the fields beyond. Mm. The advance was only halted when Russian Cossacks were sighted on their open left flank, a warning that Bennigsen's army was not far off. The coalition offensive was going nowhere, with most of its modest gains lost to French counterattacks. But there was one sector where the coalition had more success that morning. General Goulai's Austrian Third Corps with orders to threaten Napoleon's line of retreat, advanced over marshy ground towards Lindenau. Ney had to divert Bertrand's 4th Corps to reinforce the village and ensure the road to France was kept open. Napoleon was waiting for Ney's reinforcements before launching his attack on Schwarzenberg. But now, 4th Corps was tied down at Lindenau. Yeah, and that's a pretty important assignment, keeping 
the road to France open. I mean, Napoleon, well, I mean, not that long ago, he was in Russia, so he's been uh, in sort of worse positions, uh, you know, geographically, but, you know, he is basically surrounded by enemy armies, so he needs to keep uh, an escape communication supply route open, um, you know, for obvious reasons. This time, uh, you know, unlike in Russia, not because of the geography, but because of his opponents, you know, he is almost completely surrounded, um, fighting this large scale battle. So, you know, he needs to keep that in mind. And there was more bad news from Ney. Blücher's <clears throat> army of Silesia was approaching from the northwest. Marmont's 6th Corps had had to turn about to keep the Prussians at bay. Heavy fighting broke out around Merkern, the village itself held by elite French Marines, mm. while Dombrovsky's Polish division clung on to Vidrich under attack from an entire Russian corps. This was a nasty surprise for Napoleon, who'd thought Blücher was still a day's march away. But the old Prussian general, hearing cannon fire to the south, had urged his men on and into the attack. Blücher intended to draw as many French troops onto himself as possible to assist Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia. His actions and the bloody fight for Merkern may just have saved the coalition from defeat. Wow. So... <laughs> Sounds pretty major. I guess we're going to see how important this action was. But, you know, this is the sort of decisive action from coalition generals that we might not have seen a couple years ago. You know, we might not have seen before they were so soundly beaten by Napoleon and forced to learn from their defeats. But now they know, you know, now they're better trained, they're better prepared. They know, uh, you know, they're better prepared tactically. You know, they know they have to take decisive action when the situation presents itself. So, you know, hat, hats off. You know, hats off to coalition forces really learning <laughs> how to fight against Napoleon. Learning from Napoleon, taking his tactics. Napoleon was outnumbered across the whole battlefield. Mm. But in the south, he still had a numerical advantage. Not as large as he'd hoped, nor likely to last long. Schwarzenberg and Alexander were already moving up reserves, though Schwarzenberg now found that his were on the wrong side of the Pleiser River, costing precious hours. It was now or never for Napoleon. Mm. At 2 p.m., he ordered the attack to begin. A grand battery of 180 guns blasted the enemy lines. Then Victor's 2nd Corps, Lauriston's 5th Corps, and the Young Guard began their advance. In support, Murat gathered two entire cavalry corps, 10,000 horsemen, and led them in one of the great mass cavalry charges of the Napoleonic Wars. Cuirassiers of the 1st Heavy Cavalry Division broke through to the main enemy battery. Some even nearly reached the three coalition monarchs. Hmm. But the ground was marshy and broken by fences and ditches. The French horses were soon exhausted and the squadrons disordered. Austrian cuirassiers and Russian Guard cavalry were coming up from the south. When these fresh Allied cavalry reserves charged the French, a great melee ensued. But the French were eventually driven back to their start line. Yeah, that, that's not good at all for the French, because they need this push to work out. They need to maintain momentum here, because, you know, as we're seeing, the longer they wait, the more reinforcements the coalition can call, the more coalition troops arrive. So the French really need to maintain this momentum and keep pushing forward if they want to, you know, win this battle. 
Maison's division of the V Corps was involved in a desperate struggle for Golden Gossa. The fighting swept back and forth through the village, the streets filling with dead and wounded from both sides. Jeez. But as Russian and Prussian guard regiments arrived to reinforce the village, the French were forced to fall back. Around 4 p.m., the Austrian Reserve Corps finally arrived and renewed the assault on Markleberg, one of the morning's objectives, which was finally secured. Mm. By 5 p.m., it was clear that Napoleon didn't have enough reserves to force a decisive outcome in the south. To the north, Merkern was being stubbornly held by French marines with lethal close-range artillery support. But despite terrible losses, York's Prussian corps continued to attack. Marshal Marmont himself was wounded twice, but mm. remained in command. Finally, a brilliant charge by Prussian hussars triggered a French rout. Merkern fell as Marmont's corps streamed back towards Leipzig. <clears throat> All right, then the coalition troops are coming in from the north, you know, and that sort of touches on something we've seen throughout the Napoleonic Wars is the immense toughness and perseverance of the uh, rank and file troops. You know, initially, uh, it was an accolade given mostly to the French troops, you know, who were driven by their victories and driven with purpose. Um, but over time, you know, we saw, uh, you know, we saw toughness on all sides of the conflict, particularly as the coalition army sort of reformed and trained and improved discipline, um, where, you know, at this point we can really see sort of the drive, the toughness uh, from the rank and file troops on both sides to a really... Uh, impressive extent and you know sort of and we saw the same thing in Russia I mean we saw to some extent desperation um, from both the French and the Russian troops you know they had no choice but to keep fighting um, and you know that's one of the reasons why a lot of this combat was so brutal because the troops would fight until the very end they would give it all that they had as dusk fell around 6 p.m., fighting died out across the battlefield. The first day of the battle had cost the French an estimated 25,000 casualties. Jesus. The coalition, at least 30,000. <laughs> In one day. Napoleon had come close, but failed to land a decisive blow. The chance for victory was slipping from his grasp. Yeah, I mean, the coalition will have more men arriving, not to mention, you know, I, I don't really think Napoleon can afford to be losing 25,000 men in one day. The situation just continues to deteriorate from his perspective. Yikes. Day two. Sunday the 17th of October brought a lull, with both armies exhausted by the previous day's fighting. Mm. Napoleon needed to rest his troops and resupply them with ammunition, which was running dangerously low. He also sent a message to his father-in-law, Emperor <laughs> Francis I, suggesting an armistice and finally offering concessions. About the ally. Wow. I, I think that that's actually a big moment. Napoleon not only suggesting an armistice, but the important part of that is offering concessions. That is a pretty big moment because Napoleon was always intent on keeping what he had earned. You know, he never, ever wanted to give anything up. Concessions were not Napoleon's style at all. You know, he fought for, you know, what he gains, the territory, the power, the control, and he would not give it up. So, at least from my perspective, him offering some concessions, I'm not sure how major they were, but offering any concessions 
really shows you the difficult position he's in at this point. You know, sort of more desperate um, politically than he ever has been. I mean, you know, the the retreat from Russia was extremely desperate, of course. That was life and death. But at this point, you can see sort of the the military and political position he's in from, uh, you know, him reaching out. Eyes were no longer interested. Mm. They knew time was on their side. The only major combat that day occurred in the north, where Blücher continued to attack. Russian infantry stormed Eutrich and Gorlis. Russian hussars charged and routed part of Arigi's 3rd Cavalry Corps. Mm. That day, Napoleon received 14,000 reinforcements when Rainier's French Saxon 7th Corps arrived from the northeast. But the same day, the coalition received more than 100,000 reinforcements as their armies continued to converge on Leipzig. Colorado's Austrian 1st Corps Benigsen's Army of Poland, and Bernadotte's Army of the North, though the latter was widely criticised for his leisurely march to the battlefield. Hmm. The next day, Napoleon would face odds of nearly two to one. It was time for the Emperor to begin planning his retreat. Yeah. I mean, yeah, once again, we can see the people who were there understood the importance of this battle. Um, and I, I guess we'll see what Napoleon's going to do, prepare for a retreat, I guess. I mean, it seems like the only way uh, out of this. I mean, he's already basically surrounded. Uh, he's in a really, really risky situation at this point. You know, everything's closing in, closing in, and it could be about to crumble for Napoleon. Day three, here we go. On Monday morning, the sun shone across 40 square miles of battlefield, on which nearly half a million troops and 2,000 cannon were assembled. Wow. Soldiers from France, Germany, Russia, Austria, Poland, Italy, Sweden, the Netherlands, and even Britain. This was truly the Battle of the Nations. In preparation for his withdrawal, Napoleon pulled back his forces into a tighter defensive perimeter and ordered Bertrand's 4th Corps to march west to secure the army's line of retreat. Mm. Two divisions of the Young Guard under Marshal Mortier took their place at Lindenau. Schwarzenberg, meanwhile, planned to close the net on Napoleon with six converging attacks. Jeez. I mean, just the absolute scale of this battle. It, it's immense. It's almost unbelievable. Um, and, you know, they, they mentioned this is why it was the battle of the nations. You know, you can see, I mean, obviously, we've seen this entire conflict, how all-encompassing um, and destructive it's been. But, you know, you can really see why this made such an impression <clears throat> on the entire continent of Europe you know, uh, monarchs and leaders throughout the continent, people throughout the continent. Now, you can see how this entire conflict had such an impact. And, you know, the uh, peace negotiations following the conflict would, you know, really change the geopolitical order of Europe. You know, it, it really makes sense how influential this whole thing was when you see, you know, just the scale of the battles, all the different nations involved, all the different leaders involved. You know, just a really, really crazy, all-encompassing event. Fighting in the south began around 8 a.m. The Austrians took Dörlitz, but Marshal Udino led a counterattack at the head of a young guard division and drove mm. them out again. Schwarzenberg was so alarmed by this reverse that he sent orders to recall Gulai's 3rd Corps. General Barclay's troops initially faced little opposition as they took Wachau and Liebert-Volkwitz, scenes of such bitter fighting two days before. 
but now scarcely defended. Barclay then paused, waiting for Bennigsen to get into position on his right, before continuing his attack. Bennigsen's troops had more ground to cover, but towards noon they'd driven back Macdonald's infantry and taken their objectives. They would now wait for Bernadotte's army to link up on their right, but the Army of the North was again making slow progress, for which many again blamed its commander, who seemed exceedingly cautious about facing his old master in battle. Yeah, I was going to say, I wonder if it has anything to do with, you know, Bernadotte's association with Napoleon. Perhaps, <clears throat> I mean, maybe uh, a little bit of residual loyalty, or perhaps he was just worried. That That's probably more it. I mean, he knows Napoleon better um, than probably any of the other commanders of the coalition. So <laughs> I can see why he'd be a little afraid, cautious perhaps. Um, so maybe that's why he was going so slowly. Blücher, in contrast, did not hesitate to launch Russian infantry against Leipzig's northern defences, hmm. though their attack failed with heavy losses. Yeah, that's a great quote. I mean... You know, this sort of just highlights something that, you know, we already know and we've known for a while, but, you know, the personal uh, charisma of Napoleon himself, you know, his ability to arrive and inspire the men around him. I mean, that was really <clears throat> one of Napoleon's best traits. I mean, you know, we talk about his tactical brilliance, you know, his intelligence, all of that. Um, but one of his best qualities was truly his charisma, you know, his ability to inspire those around him. Um, and, and that's sort of what this quote is highlighting. By 2 p.m., Napoleon was hard-pressed on all fronts, but holding his own. His attention was now focused on Probst Haider, key to his southern front, under attack from Kleist's Prussian 2nd Corps. French troops had turned the village into a fortress and inflicted terrible losses on the advancing Prussians. Mm. Probst Haida was soon engulfed in smoke and fire as fighting raged on all sides. Some Prussian regiments lost half their men attacking the village. Wow. while three French generals were killed as they organised its defence. Napoleon even sent in Friant's division of the guard to reinforce the position. Yeah, I mean, once again, it's that brutal urban fighting that uh, we've talked about in this video and we've talked about in several videos in this series, just, uh, you know, the, the high death toll, the brutality the close quarters nature of it. Um, you know, we, we've just seen that throughout this conflict. <clears throat> to the north, Bernadotte's army was finally joining the battle in earnest. Marmont had assembled 137 guns around Schoenefeld, which poured fire into the Russian ranks. In response, Bernadotte massed 200 guns of his own. Mm. The fields were soon strewn with the dead and wounded, as the sheer weight of fire made it impossible for either side to advance. Around 3pm, von Bülow's Prussian Corps, supported by Austrian Jaegers and its small British rocket detachment, attacked Poundsdorf. Grenier's 7th Corps could not withstand the onslaught. An hour later, around 3,000 Saxon soldiers rushed over to the enemy and surrendered. Wow! The Saxons were deeply disillusioned with their French allies. Their main wish now was for a quick end to a war that had ravaged their homeland for many months. Okay, and this is... I literally talked about earlier in this video how Napoleon's army had become more multi-ethnic and multinational 
throughout the years, as we had seen in the campaign in Russia. Um, and the Saxon contingent was a big part of that. Um, but, you know, as we've seen, that can cause um, disorder and in some cases, cases insubordination. And that's what we're getting here. Um, you know, their homeland's been ravaged, they're disillusioned, not to mention they're Germans. And they're fighting against other Germans, you know. Um, modern nationalism was only just emerging at this point. Um, and actually, the Napoleonic Wars were a big part of that. Modern nationalism would really get uh, a kickstart following the Napoleonic Wars. Um, but even still, even in its infant phase, you know, these guys are Germans. And they're fighting against other Germans, you know, it probably makes it easier for them to, you know, surrender or go over to the other side, I would imagine. <clears throat> the hole in the line created by the Saxons' defection was soon plugged by guard cavalry. But the coalition juggernaut could not be stopped. Mm. Towards dusk, under relentless Russian pressure, Marmont abandoned the burning ruins of Schoenefeld while the Prussians took Sellerhausen. In the south, Probst Haida still held, but the situation was grim for Napoleon. The third day's fighting cost both sides another 25,000 casualties. Jesus. Napoleon's army was exhausted, outnumbered, virtually encircled, and critically low on ammunition. Finally, the Emperor gave the order to retreat. Probably the only thing he could do, honestly. I mean, he is getting... He was already surrounded. Now the coalition is really tightening in on the French forces. And they're going to start to squeeze and squeeze them until they crush them if uh, this continues. So, you know, the only path to survival, um, you know, for the French forces is to you know, make a miraculous escape at this point. <clears> hmm. <throat> Day four. Seems like it's coming to an end. Overnight, under cover of darkness and early morning fog, the French army withdrew behind Leipzig's walls and at 4 a.m. began its retreat west, crossing the single bridge over the Elster River that led back to France. Hey, well, uh, good thing that escape route wasn't completely blocked off by the coalition, huh? We talked about that earlier. That was a uh, necessary route to keep open in terms of uh, French survival. There'd been time and materials to build extra bridges, but in what would prove a serious oversight, no one had given the necessary orders. Uh -oh. Furthermore, there was no clear plan for Leipzig's defence, which was left to a jumble of understrength units, mostly oh. Poles and Germans. That's not good. It seems like uh, the retreat was not as planned out as perhaps it should have been. Napoleon left Leipzig around 10 a.m. Behind him, there were scenes of mounting chaos and confusion the city's streets jammed with troops, guns, and wagons. The 20,000 wounded troops in the city had little hope of escape. Jeez. 30 minutes later, shells began to rain on the city as the coalition launched an all-out assault from north, east, and south. Rear guard held the city's gates for as long as they could, but they were soon overwhelmed by the enemy, and savage street fighting broke out across the city. I mean, we've talked about urban fighting a lot now, but just think of all the men packed in there you know, the tens, if not hundreds of thousands, and, uh, you know, the close close quarters and melee combat that's going on. I mean, it's just absolutely, I mean, it's just brutal, horrifying to think about. Um, and, you know, 
this sort of combat will, uh, you know, we'll see it repeated many times throughout the next 200 years, uh, unfortunately. This is a new era of warfare. A barge packed with gunpowder had been moored beneath the Elster Bridge so that it could be quickly destroyed after the rearguard crossed. Around 2 p.m., a corporal lit the fuse when he saw Russian soldiers on the far bank, even though the bridge was still packed with troops, wagons and horses. Ah, yikes. The bridge was destroyed in a gigantic explosion that trapped 30,000 men and 30 generals on the wrong side of the river. Oh man, seems like Napoleon might have left the retreat too late. I mean, we were talking about from pretty early in this conflict, honestly, right after day one, about how, you know, the battle, you know, the French path to victory was kind of already gone, and the best option was a retreat, and yet, you know, it took him a while to actually get here. Um, you know, perhaps it was, you know, like I said, I don't know the play-by-play, -play, what exactly was going on, but perhaps it was left too late, because now it seems like a lot of uh, French uh, forces and a lot of the officer corps has been left behind. Panic broke out among those who suddenly found themselves cut off. Most became prisoners, but some tried to swim for it, including mm. the Polish Prince Poniatowski, wow. made a marshal by Napoleon just three days before. Weak from his wounds, he rode his horse into the river, but as it tried to climb the steep far bank, it rolled over him, and he was drowned. Jeez. Marshal MacDonald had also been cut off by the blast, and resolved to escape or die trying. He found a place where engineers had cut down two trees as a makeshift bridge, and made his attempt. And there I was, one foot on either trunk and the abyss below me. A high wind was blowing. I was wearing a large cloak, and fearing that someone would grab at it, I got rid of it. I was already three quarters of the way across when some men decided to follow me. Their unsteady feet caused the trunks to shake and I fell into the water. Fortunately, I could touch the bottom, but the bank was steep, the soil loose and slippery. Some of the enemy's skirmishers came up. They fired at me point blank and missed me. And some of our men who happened to be nearby drove them off and helped me out. I was wet from head to foot, breathless and sweating heavily from my efforts. Marshal Marmont, who had got across early in the day, gave me a horse. I wanted dry clothes more, hmm. but they were not to be had. Jeez, what a story. I mean, frankly, it's remarkable he even made it across. What, uh... I'm glad we have his writings, but what an experience, huh? It really shows you the, the desperation. We have such high-ranking men um, getting across the river in any way they can. Um... You know, not to mention that, you know, as we talked about, or as they mentioned in the video, a lot of the defenders of the city who were left were Germans and Poles. Um, you know, the Poles have been <laughs> left behind, left in a bad situation, as usual, unfortunately. Um, I mean, we'll see the fate of the Poles and, and Poland um, following the end of the conflict, but it's just an unfortunate situation. The loss of the bridge turned what was already a heavy defeat for Napoleon into a disastrous one. Yeah. Later that day, the three allied monarchs met in the center of Leipzig to celebrate their great victory. It had come at enormous cost. Exact numbers are impossible to establish, but in four days fighting, the coalition armies suffered at least 50 2,000 casualties. Napoleon, who could less afford such losses, came off worse. 47,000 killed and wounded, 35,000 taken prisoner, 325 guns lost. Yeah, I mean a massive cost to both sides, but they're exactly right. Napoleon could not afford those losses, and not to mention that 
massive and brutal loss of life, but it was in service of a pretty decisive Allied victory. I mean, this is a this is a big win for the coalition. You know, they didn't get Napoleon yet, but this is exactly what they wanted. I mean, this is a big loss for the French forces. More men were killed and wounded at Leipzig than in any European battle before the First World War. Wow. Sir George Jackson, the British ambassador to Austria, rode over the battlefield with Metternich, the Austrian <clears throat> foreign minister, two days later. Mm. A more revolting and sickening spectacle I never beheld, he wrote. Scarcely could we move forward a step without passing over the dead body of some poor fellow, gashed with wounds and clotted with blood, another perhaps without an arm or a leg, here and there a headless trunk or a head only, which caused our horses to stumble or start aside. It made one's blood run cold to glance upon the upturned faces of the dead. We got over this field of glory as quickly as we could. That's a great quote to include because it really gives us some insight into the events that occurred following the war. And we talked about this earlier, how, you know, everyone was affected. It was so all-encompassing that, um, you know, things had to change following the war. But <clears throat> that's a great quote from a British ambassador with Metternich. Um, and, you know, men like those, particularly Metternich, would be responsible for creating the new geopolitical order following the Napoleonic Wars. Um, I mean, Metternich in particular, he was known as sort of the architect of the, the, it was called the Concert of Europe. It was basically the geopolitical system that was developed uh, following the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and, and, you know, these diplomats, these politicians were influenced by the, you know, <coughs> death and destruction and brutality that they saw during this conflict. I mean, the main, sort of their main goal was to avoid another conflict um, of this character, you know, to avoid a major conflict and avoid this loss of life. And you can sort of imagine, you know, they're, um, you know, seeing these fields and fields of dead bodies. Uh, and the British ambassador there referred to it as a field of glory, sort of in this very sarcastic, sardonic way. You know, there's sort of, they're seeing the brutality, and they want to avoid that. And so th it's actually a great insight into what inspired a lot of these diplomats and politicians um, and, and these world leaders, these monarchs, who would then go on to create um, a geopolitical system that was designed around avoiding large-scale conflicts. I mean, it's kind of similar in many ways to you know World War II and sort of the, the fallout from that. Um, you know, we just see these men exposed to these horrors, and they want to do something to change it. <clears throat> mm. Yeah. I mean, definitely true in some ways, and I'm sure it definitely felt that way, you know? Napoleon had gone from a position where he had all basically all of Europe subdued, apart from the Brits and the conflict on the Iberian Peninsula. Apart from that, he had all of Europe's either subdued, um, defeated, or allied to him. So, you know, he was truly the master of Europe. You know, like he said, all of Europe was marching with us. Um, of course, not voluntarily. <laughs> um, you know, they were not happy about it. The French didn't want to see that part. But, I mean, he was right. You know, he was the master of Europe, and now... It must feel like that's crumbled so quickly, and now all of Europe is closing in on him. You know, it's all gone wrong. Um, so that's uh, that's an interesting, uh, you know, quotation from Napoleon. Napoleon had suffered a calamitous defeat. Yeah. He had lost the battle for Germany. His domination of Europe appeared at an end. With 80,000 survivors, he began a fighting retreat to the French border. Mm. There was now no chance of rescue for the 100,000 men trapped in garrisons across Germany and Poland, though some would hold out for another five months. 
Marshal Murat took his leave of the Emperor, assuring wow. him of his loyalty, but secretly planning to cut a deal with the Allies to save his throne in Naples. Hmm. It was the last time the two men saw each other. Wow. Eleven days after the Battle of Leipzig, Napoleon's former allies, the Bavarians, tried to block his escape at Hanau with 40,000 men. The Bavarian commander, von Freda, had served with Napoleon in many campaigns. But on seeing his deployment for battle, Napoleon remarked, I made him a count, but I couldn't make him a general. Yeah, so I mean, we just talked about that quote that they showed about how, you know, Napoleon, you know, it feels like all of Europe is closing in on him. We're seeing from Yura and this fella right here, there's also a personal element to it. I'm sure Napoleon feels betrayed. He feels like uh, his friends, his allies are turning against him. You know, this is also, uh, it's personal. You know, it's not just political. The French Emperor then ordered the Imperial Guard to lead an attack that forced the enemy to fall back in disarray. <laughs> the French army reached the safety of Mainz three days later. Napoleon himself pushed on to Paris to contain the political damage from his defeat. Behind him, his empire was being dismantled. Mm. On the 4th of November, the coalition announced the dissolution of the Confederation of the Rhine, several of its former members now joining the war against France. In the Illyrian provinces, local revolts, Austrian invasion and British naval support brought an end to French rule. In North Italy, Eugène was retreating steadily before the advance of von Hiller's Austrian army. While in Hamburg, Marshal Davu, with 34,000 troops, would soon be cut off and under siege. Oh, no. Napoleon's situation was desperate. Yeah, look, I mean, at this point, <clears throat> you know, at the time, of course, you don't know what's going to happen. I mean, anything could happen. Napoleon it could come back. But, you know, look at the writing on the wall. Um, even if Napoleon manages to defend France itself... The French Empire is in a worse position than it's been in years. Um, the Empire's falling apart. I mean, all of their conquered territory, their sister republics, these new uh, countries that France had created, you know, they're all falling apart. Um, all of Napoleon's conquests, uh, it's all crumbling. So, you know, you can see everything, you know, just going. You know, even if Napoleon does manage to come back, it's looking really bad right now. But in the next campaign, fought for France itself, Napoleon would prove that he was still the master of war. Okay. All right, well, I mean, I'm excited to see... Uh... A Napoleon come back, you know, we've seen L after L from Napoleon, let's, you know, let's, uh, uh, let's see some of his brilliance in action, um, yeah, that was a great video, um, you know, France is now in a worse position than it has been in, God, I would say about two decades, you know, um, the coalition is closing in on French borders, you know, it hasn't really been this bad since, I would say, like, the mid-1790s. Since, you know, like I mentioned earlier, since before Napoleon was really a major figure. Um, but, you know, that, uh, that little teaser at the end seems like we're going to get some classic Napoleon action in the next video. So I'm excited to get into that. Um, so we've got, uh, I'm looking at the series right now, we've got Napoleon Endgame and the Battle of Waterloo uh, left, and then, uh, you know, the Marshalls videos. So not long to go. Um, so yeah, you know, I really enjoyed this video. I've enjoyed the whole series. I'm excited to, uh, you know, watch the final videos. Um, I'm a little sad that it's coming to an end, but I've had a great time with it. 
Um, I'm glad you guys have stuck with me through this. Um, you guys seem to be <laughs> having a good time as well, so I appreciate that. Um, if you are having a good time, please leave a like, subscribe, check out the Patreon, uh, all of that good stuff. <coughs> <clears throat> Uh, apologies for the throat clearing and coughing during this video. Like I said, uh, I have COVID right now, so I apologize if that was uh, annoying at all. Um, but anyway, uh, I hope to see you guys uh, on the next video. Um, hope you guys are all having uh, a good day. Hope you're all doing well, uh, and I'll see you again next time. Goodbye.